Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Sunday morning worship service here at South Jefferson Baptist Church. We're glad to see those of you who are joining us in the room today, and we're thankful for those who are able to join by Facebook Live as well. I do have a couple of announcements for you all as we begin this morning. Um, today is our collection day for um, any kind of cards or thoughtful uh, gifts, things like that, for our sunshine basket for Diane Carver. Um, so if you've brought a card or something like that that you want to leave for Diane, there is a collection basket in the back of the church. It's at the back of the organ side um, on the offering table. Um, so if you want to leave that there, the WMU will make sure that Diane receives those cards. Many of you know that um, Richard, Pastor Richard's dad did pass away this week, um, and the funeral arrangements for him are for tomorrow. If you have a bulletin, they are in the bulletin. So the bulletin has the visitation times. Uh, it also has the service time as well as the addresses um, for the funeral service itself and then for the internment as well. So if you're planning to attend, make sure you pick up uh, the bulletin so that you can see those addresses. That, that has also uh, been published. Myra, did we publish that on our Facebook page? Yes, we did. I knew the Carvers had all shared it on Facebook, and I got their personal one mixed up with the church one. So you can see it on uh, Facebook as well. But the funeral itself is tomorrow at uh, 1230 in Mount Washington if you would like to attend. We do have a thank you note from Margaret Poe in the bulletin announcements as well. So uh, make sure you check that out. And thank you to all those um, who've assisted Margaret uh, as she's recovering from her surgery. We definitely appreciate being able to be the body of Christ and support our brothers and sisters when they go through um, trying times. Triple L meets this week, so that's on Thursday, January 20th at 11 a.m. That's for all of our senior adults, a time of fellowship and a time to grow together and um, to live and laugh and love. So if you want to attend that, please mark your calendar for that and uh, plan to be there on <coughs> Thursday. Okay, that's all that I have in the way of announcements this morning. All right, if you're able, would you please stand together with me? We are going to begin and be called to worship this morning with a reading from the book of Psalms. I'll read Psalm 16. This is verses 5 through 11. Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. You make known to me the path of life and you fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Let's pray together this morning. Lord God, we come before you today saying that you alone are our portion and our cup. God, we know that you are the God of security and that you alone make our lot secure. Lord God, we have come to worship you today because you have given us a delightful inheritance through Jesus Christ, our Lord. You have made us sons and daughters, dear Lord. You have shared with us the inheritance that you gave to Christ himself. And we come before you today, Lord, with hearts that experience eternal pleasures at your right hand. Lord, may we worship you in joy today. May we sing to you um, with the security that the psalmist expressed, knowing that you are the one taking care of us. You are the one watching over us day and night. When we read from your word, Lord, may we be encouraged by it and built up in our faith because of it. Lord, as we listen to the preaching of your word today, I pray that our hearts would be convicted and that we would learn the lessons that you have for us to learn today. Lord, give us hands and feet that are ready to enact that lesson and to take that lesson into the world and to live it in our lives when we leave this place this morning. Lord, we praise you today because you have made known to us the path of life through Jesus Christ, our Savior, and you have filled us with joy in your presence because Jesus opened the door and allowed us to walk boldly into your presence. Help us to worship you in that joy today, dear Lord. It's in Jesus Christ's blessed name that we pray. Amen. 
Would you look around you this morning and give a wave and a smile to those who are sitting next to you, make them feel welcome? And we are filled with joy in the presence of the Lord this morning. And let's sing with that joy in our hearts as we sing, To God Be the Glory. his portion in his cup and the Lord was the one who made his lot in life secure that is a firm foundation the Lord Jesus Christ in whom we can trust let's think about that firm foundation this morning and remember that when we experience trials when we walk through uh, the troubled waters that Jesus is with us through those and he has told us that he will not abandon us how firm a foundation
continue to worship this morning.
Amen. Praise be to our Lord Jesus Christ. You may be seated today. It is good to be with you this morning. Unfortunately, not under good circumstances. But you know, as we gather this morning, as we all contemplate the loss of a Brother Carver, the one thing, the reason why it's so good that we can gather this morning, and it's so good that we can come to moments like this, is what Paul said in Thessalonians, that we don't grieve as those who have no hope. Now, it doesn't say we don't grieve. It just says we don't grieve as others, as those who don't have hope. And so this morning, as we gather together, we come grieving with hope. A hope that cannot be taken away from us, is the song we've just sung, because of what Christ has done. If you will, turn with me to 1 Kings 19, starting with verse 1. have to say this, that this passage was a passage that uh, was assigned to me back in the, uh, in the snow age when I was at Southern Seminary for a, uh, a, a, a seminary class sermon. And although this is going to be a whole lot different uh, than that sermon then, this passage has always been a, a very important passage for me especially as I began to experience life and realize that the Christian faith is not all peaches and cream. Life itself is not all peaches and cream. I, I was aware of that this week, a Tuesday, when I shaved off my scrub, as my wife would call it. I looked at the calendar, I mean, at the weather, and said, you know, it's going to warm up. This would be a time to do it. Last year, I did it on the 4th of January. I had to wait a little bit for this year. And lo and behold, the next day it turned cold. I wish I had it back. But isn't that life? Life isn't what I want. Life is what I have, and I need to make the most of it. Well, there was a guy by the name of Elijah, a great prophet, a man who was given that mantle at a very difficult time in the life of the people of Israel. And they were not faithful. Even their king Ahab, who in a sense, the king position was given to lead the people of Israel to follow God. And yet he abdicated all of that to his very wicked wife Jezebel, who was a follower of Baal. She rounded up all of God's prophets except one, killed them all, and established Baal as the one true God in Israel. That was a difficult time. We are living in difficult times today, aren't we? We still, you know, I remember listening to some, some folks talk about the new year and, and they said, we can't wait to get going and get over this pandemic. And guess what? It's still with us. And probably with us stronger and meaner than ever. And we don't even know. They, don't even, they can't even tell us when this thing is. It would be so easy for us to get, get down and, and depressed over what we experience. And add on to that, it's almost like biblical prophecy. We're experiencing all kinds of calamities. Fires out west destroying total communities. Tornadoes in western Kentucky destroying total communities. And there's a lot of pandemics that we seem to kind of sweep under a rug that our city is experiencing right now. With all the murders of young people 
And folks, the simple explanation are two things. Gangs and drugs. Those two go hand in hand. That's what we're experiencing. And it would be so easy for us as Christians to just want to throw up our hands and quit. There was a prophet who did great things. But at the end of the day, when he was threatened, he threw up his hand and quit. We almost have to go to the 18th chapter to really understand the background. Elijah was coming to town and, and uh, Ahab heard he was coming and said to him, you are the dude that is messing up our, our nation. He simply was preaching repentance and get back with God. That what Ahab was calling messing up our community. And so Elijah thought, well, you know, now is the time. We've been playing these games. Now is the time. So he set up the challenge at the OK Corral, so to speak. He said to the 400 prophets of Baal, let's have a competition. Let's meet at the altar, and we'll have two bulls selected, equal bulls. You go first. You prepare your altar, you call up your God, and let him send fire to destroy the altar, and I will do the same. And who, whosoever God destroys the altar would be the one true God of Israel. And so he said, you know, I'll let you go first. And so they set up their altar. They began crying out to Baal from early morning to noon. And so Elijah thought, well, you know, I'm going to have a little fun with this. So he began to taunt these prophets of Baal and said, uh, maybe your God is, is uh, too busy right now. Maybe he's gone to the bathroom. Maybe he's gone on vacation. Maybe he's just asleep and you need to yell a little longer, louder to wake him up. And so they did. And they even, as their, their tradition, they began to cut themselves and bleed profusely and finally nothing. So at evening time, Elijah just simply began to prepare the altar of the Lord using 12 stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Cut up the bull, prepared the altar, and then made one unusual request. Take large jars of water and soak the altar three times. Man, I don't care what you have. You could not, not humanly ignite that altar. That's what he did. And so he prayed a simple prayer asking God to, to answer the prayer so that the people of Israel could recognize the fact that he is the one and only true God of Israel. And as soon as he finished his prayer, the fire from heaven came and not only consumed the altar, lapped up the water, but everything around the, the altar was sin. And then he immediately said, round up those 400 prophets of Baal, take them outside the city, and he murdered every one of them. Well, he thought that was it. But then our friend Ahab tattletailed to him to Jezebel. And this is what we, we start at that point in the 19th chapter, first verse on the 19th chapter of Kings. Now Abel, Ahab told Jezebel everything that Elijah had done and how he killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, may the gods deal with me 
be even more so severe by this time tomorrow if I do not make your life more than one of those. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he, and when he came to Bathsheba and Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he may die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. And then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once, an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Oreb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very zealous for the Lord. God Almighty, the Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with a sword, and I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me. And the Lord said, Get out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind toward the mountains apart, and shattered the rocks before the Lord. The Lord was not in the winds. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake quake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he replied again, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The, the Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. And I, the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me. And the Lord said to him, Go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus where there you would anoint Hazel king over Aram. Also Jehu, of, the son of Nimshi, king over Israel. Appoint Elijah, son of Shempat, and Abel, Meho, to succeed you as prophet. Jehu would put to death any who escaped the sword of Hazel. Elisha shall put to death those who escaped the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knee have not bowed to Baal, whose mouth have not kissed him. May we pray. Father God, as we read this awesome story, we see the power of your love. Yes, we see a lot of power a lot of destructive power. But your word tells us you're not in that. That's not who you are. You are the God of reconciliation, a God of redemption, a God of restoration. And yet, Lord, we are so fearful. We're so fearful of what is yet to come. We are so concerned about our nation and its political future. We're so concerned about our health and the future of our health because of the pandemic. And yet, Lord, you're standing whispering to us, just trust me. I've got it under control. Just trust me and follow me. Father God, there is no better suggestion, no better command, no better thing we can do 
but in all things, put our trust completely in you. In Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen. You know, this is a dramatic story. A dramatic story with a little sadness. A little sadness that God established the people of Israel to be his people, to be a blessing to the nations. And here they are. Not even a nation worth looking at. A lot of turmoil, a lot of junk going on, just like our nation today. People look toward, look up to the king of Israel as their spiritual leader. Because he was established to lead the people of Israel to follow God. And yet he had turned that over to his awful wife, who later gets her in. But at this point, she threatens Elisha. Now, one thing we need to understand, Elisha just gone through some major successes. <laughs> he had a lot of courage, didn't he? I mean, he had to have a lot of courage to stand up to Ahab and said, I don't care what you say. He called him the troublemaker. But I know one thing. God needs to be on this throne. And so he did what he did to put God back on the throne. But then when this evil woman threatened his life, it seemed as if he was a different person. His world literally fell apart. But how many of us Yes, even us preachers have allowed life experiences to kick our feet out from under us. God asks a question, ask a question twice. What are you doing here? And maybe we need to ask ourselves that question. What are we doing here? Yes, the world has dropped out from under us. Yes, there is no sense of the same, the, the, the routine. Yes, yes, all that. But one thing we need to remember and learn from Elijah's experience, that life with life, with life with God, there is no promise that everything is going our way. It went his way for a while, and he was very successful. Isn't it odd that he was able to feed 400 men and could not defeat one person? He let one person chase him to a broom tree and a cave. Let's go to this broom tree. Now, many translations call it a tree. Now, the G King James called it a juniper tree. Uh, the new Revised Standard, or the new uh, International Standard version, says it right. It's a bush. It's about the inside, the canopy, below the canopy, is about two to three feet to the ground. I mean, Elijah had to be crawling on his belly to get under this thing. And usually it's out, and if you can get under it, you have some protection. And he was low, as low as a human can go. What's happened to us with this pandemic? A lot of routines have changed, haven't they? A lot of things we used to rely upon, we can't any longer. 
some of the things, especially early on, that we gained strength and support and, and, and kind of entertainment was gone. And there's struggles whether or not they, they may go again. The NHL, the NFL, the NBA, they're talking about shutting things down because they have so much COVID in their teams and, and in their head office. Living in a country that's built on sports, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Maybe we need to rethink our priorities. That's a good thing about situations like this. God helped Elijah to rethink his priorities. He had to stop and ask some questions. Questions that are faith-based. Questions like, why in the world did you create me? What can I give to the world? What is my true identity? My life with God. And I guess the one that we hear the loudest, unspoken, God, do you still love me? Most of us, if we were honest, would have asked those questions maybe even recently. When life began to push us down, when life begins to kick at us and sends us off under a shrub and a cave, it causes us to stop and think. But you know, that's probably a good position. Because he stopped long enough for God to get his attention. Now, as soon as he crawled under that juniper tree and fell asleep, it said suddenly the angel appeared. God is not going to leave us or forsake us. The Great Commission tells us, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And that means he is with us on this earth until we see him face to face when nobody can get hold of us because we're in his arms. God is with us. And as Christians, God has, as Brother Richard preached last Sunday, God has given us the power of the Holy Spirit within us the empowering presence of God in us so that we can live through these moments, experience these awful times, and live through them. But more importantly, allow the light of God to shine through us in the midst of it. Our faith does not exempt us from difficulties. Our faith gives us strength to live through them. The power of God in us is given to us with the reality that we're going to have difficult times. And sometimes we, like Elijah, will just cry out to God and say, just take me away. And I don't mean a cow gone time either. But take me away. I can't take it any longer. But you know, our God is big enough to hear those cries. He will not reject us when we're honest with him. Matter of fact, when we come to that point of honesty like Elijah did is when God can work with us the most. And in this time, we will rediscover our intimacy with God. You know, I think this is one of the most beautiful pictures in verses 18 in 19 of all the Bible. 
I imagine if we lived in western Kentucky, Mayfield, we'll all understand these noises, this destructive power, and wonder why God did this. But Scripture makes it plain at this moment when it said there was, excuse me, the wrong verses, verses 11. There was a great wind, hurricane, tornado, but God was not in the wind. There was a great earthquake, a destructive earthquake like the destructive wind, but God was not in the earthquake. And there was a fire. And I saw some horrible pictures. And hear the stories of people saying, I left my home just with those clothes on my back because fire was in my backyard. And they were standing before a charred community. Everything was gone. But here it says God was not in. And in this translation, it says, and a gentle whisper. Some said a still small voice. It doesn't say God was in the whisper, but he was. He is. Now, I have a little hearing issue, tinnitus. And sometimes dying has to do more than whisper. You know, God does not. Because if we're close physically enough to someone and we can read lips, close enough to where we can read lips, we will not have a bit of problem understanding what they're saying. The key is being close enough. See, God wants us close enough to him so that we can hear the whisper. His whole purpose is for us to be close with him. He has to be in his arms. But that's why he created us. In the good times as well as the bad, a time to be in his arms. Now this doesn't say that God does not punish Although the scripture says God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but we condemn ourselves by our unbelief. It's our choices. But God did, the scripture before that does say, for God so loved the world that he gave. And he's constantly giving. He gave Jesus so that we can have that intimate relationship with him. He gave us Jesus so that we can be close enough and not worry about anything because of grace to hear that voice. But more importantly, not only will we rediscover that intimacy, we will understand that God has never stopped being in God is always at work. In the midst of pandemics, in the midst of horrible social issues, in the midst of massive murders, drug and, and, and gang activity on our streets, God is still at work. But we must not focus on those things. We must keep our eyes upon Jesus. And in keeping our eyes upon Jesus, then we will hear the voice of God so clear and so distinct. I got a job for you. Now, we remember Elijah's little rant. He told us a couple of times. I mean, it's, it's not like we're going to miss it or anything. 
I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. Israel has rejected your covenant, tore down your altars and your prophets, and put your prophets to death with a sword, and I am the only one left, and they're trying to kill me too. Poor, pitiful me. But you know, God just slips right on by that. He says, okay, get yourself ready, get up, Go back the way you came. Go and anoint Hazel king, Jehu king, and Elisha to follow your steps. God is always at work. God is always inviting us to join. Now, we have a choice, either to be like Elijah, spend our time in bushes and caves, or get out and be a partner with God. Now, being a partner with God does not take away those threats on our lives. Jezebel was still wanting to kill him. Whether or not he came out of the cave or not. But the fact is now, he came out with a sense of power, a sense of responsibility, and a sense of mission. Paul said in Ephesians 2.10, we seem to kind of slip by this verse because we're talking about saved by grace through faith, not of your words, least any man should boast. But why did God save us that way? For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus. Why? To sit back and wait for the getting up morning? To have it for God to just kind of lavish us with all this kind of stuff to make our life easy? to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. He prepared Elijah to be the great prophet, even if it meant he was going to be killed like the rest of them. God does not promise us that everything's going to be safe. God promised us that he's going to be with us. Now, do you want safety or his presence? And sometimes they're not the same. When we have the presence of God, it is the eternal presence. Myra and I were discussing Brother Richard Sr.'s going, home going, and the fact that now he stands, even on his birthday, looking in the very face of Jesus. And I know we all wonder, what does he really look like? Richard Sr. has no questions about that because he's seen him. He's with him. I know we want to preserve our lives in this world. But is that really the important thing for us? Or is it have that kind of intimate relationship like Elisha and Elijah? Do we know, do we remember Elijah's end? He and Elisha were walking together and whew, he was gone. He didn't suffer it. He just went to God. And folks, that's all that's important to us. Whether we're with God here or with God in heaven, it's still being with God. And when we're with him here, living his purposes and living his plan, then whether we're poor, rich, homeless, or living in a castle, it really doesn't matter. Because we have a castle being 
prepared for us in heaven. This life is short. Kentucky lost a legend this weekend. Joe Hall, at 96 years old. I heard the other day a person who was one of the survivors of World War II died in his hundreds. He was over 100. And we think that is a long time. A drop in the bucket compared to eternity. And that's what we're going to experience in heaven. That's what Richard Sr. is experiencing now. What's more important? Having the mental lavish security of this earth or heaven. Folks, first of all, we need to live with a heavenly mentality. And when we can somehow get that together, it all, all the other things will fall into place. I think Jesus said something about that when he said, seek ye first the kingdom of God. And all the other things will take care of themselves. Let's, Father God, we thank you. We thank you for Elijah. We thank you for his story. We thank you that we can learn from his struggles when we have those same struggles. And Father, we know we all do. And we thank you for your faithfulness. And we pray that we may be just as faithful to you as you are to us. And one of these days, we will see not only Richard Sr., but others we know. And it would be a forever kind of existence. And until that day, may we live with that on our hearts and minds as we serve you together. In Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen. Would you stand together with me this morning as we enter into a time of decision and response? If you have a decision you would like to make for the Lord today, we invite you to do that. If you want to pray, the altar here is open for you to pray. And if you have a prayer concern you want to share with Brother Carpenter, he's here for you to share that. If you want to join our church or profess faith in Jesus Christ, we want to invite you to make a decision like that at this time as we sing together, Be Thou My Vision.
have had the opportunity to gather together with you today and to worship with you. I'm glad that you're here and that we are brothers and sisters in Christ together at South Jefferson Baptist Church to serve in this place and in this community. We will have our Bible study on Wednesday night at 6.30. Mike Schultz is leading that for us while the pastor is out on bereavement. So we invite you to join us for that, and we'll see you again Wednesday. We'll have worship again next Sunday as well. Mr. Bob Davis, would you pray for us today as we close?